On this railway adventure, a seaside resort in Wales with a weather guarantee and the smallest house in Great Britain. Compliments of British Rail and other lines. Hi, I'm Bernie Coppell. Just up the tracks, Mount Snowden, indoor body surfing, and Lord Aberconwy's Italian gardens. Join us from Chester to Snowden on railway adventures across Europe. About 2,000 years ago, Britain became a province of the Roman Empire. Our railway adventure takes us past an ancient reminder of Rome's occupation of Wales. We'll also visit a trendy seaside resort, ride up the highest mountain in Wales, and travel into a land with railways too small for leprechauns. Our departure is from a Victorian station in Chester, England. Our ultimate destination is Mount Snowdon in Wales. We'll discover historical treasures, botanical beauty, man-made marvels, and a miniature world. We'll see magnificent castles and a cathedral built on 14th century pillars, visit Bode Nantes Gardens, and ascend the great limestone dome. All this by British Rail, the Great Orme Tramway, Snowdon Mountain Railway, and a little side trip on the Conwy Valley Steam Line. All aboard for shore to summit. Our railway adventure takes us to the beautiful country of Wales, a small country in the United Kingdom about the size of Massachusetts, located west of England. Before reaching Wales, the trip begins in the ancient English town of Chester, about 175 miles northwest of London, easily accessible by rail. From Chester, we travel west into Wales and the port city of Conwy. From there, it's south to Bettesy Coed and the beautiful Snowdonia National Park. This railway adventure promises magnificent castles, Victorian resorts, unparalleled beaches, gardens, and spectacular scenery. We begin with one of the popular bus tours of Chester, a city on the border between England and Wales that dates back almost 2,000 years. Chester has a long and colorful history. It was founded by the Romans and is still enclosed by ancient Roman walls, originally built to protect the city. The Romans named the city Diva after the river Dee. The bridge crossing here is called the Old D Bridge, but it's not nearly as old as the ancient walls. Chester maintains its medieval feel by preserving its architecture. Even modern shops and offices known as the Rose are concealed behind antique looking fronts. The city's combination of old and modern is a delight to its visitors. Our brief bus tour of Chester ends at the town's cathedral, dating back to Norman times. The cathedral was restored in the 19th century, but the square central tower still stands on 14th century pillars, and the north sanctuary dates from about 1140. From the courtyard to the sanctuary, the cathedral is much the same as it was hundreds of years ago. Calm, relaxing, and beautiful. The ancient city walls of Chester run almost unbroken around the old center. These red sandstone walls date to Roman times, but have been rebuilt. The best of the Roman ruins are found next to the walls, including the restored amphitheater. The Romans made Britain a province of their empire shortly after the crucifixion. Nearby, there's a Roman temple that has been partially restored.
A castle can be seen over the walls of the city. It's been the headquarters of the Cheshire Regiment since Victorian times. Part of the castle is now a museum that tells the regiment's history. Uniforms, saddles, swords and medals are all on display. Summer is the perfect time to tour Chester. The streets are just as entertaining as the history. Artists and performers hold the attention of tourists and locals. Before Rome's 20th Legion came to conquer Chester, they found that the River Dee was sacred to the native Celts. It's easy to understand why. Centuries later, the river is still a major attraction. To begin our railway adventure into Wales, we depart the English town of Chester from this Victorian station. Our first stop along the North Wales coast is in Rill. This popular seaside resort comes with a weather guarantee. Even if the sun isn't shining outside, visitors can still have fun inside the sun center. A monorail glides slowly over the complex, looking down on the wave pool and water slides. Leaving Rill, the train crosses the river Cloyd, cloaked in early morning mist. The line runs along the Welsh coast to the major railroad interchange at Clondudno Junction. Just a few miles north of the main line is the Victorian resort of Clondudno. The town's two bays, Conwy and Orms, have beautiful beaches. Add the pier and promenade and you've got one of North Wales' top resorts. This is the station for the Great Orm Tramway. The Great Orm is a massive dome of limestone. The unique tramway takes visitors to the top. It was constructed in 1902 and climbs the steep, narrow streets at a maximum speed of five miles an hour, with the weight of the descending car helping pull the opposite car up the hill. Private roads and cable cars also lead to the top of the Orm. From 650 feet up, the view of the town and the bay is magnificent. The train takes us back to Clendudno Junction. But before taking the main line south, we'll take a side trip over the narrow estuary to Conwy. Here, the skyline is dominated by the massive castle. Passing trains heading for the North Wales coast add to the atmosphere of this majestic town.
Historic Conway's Main Street is a masterpiece of medieval architecture. The castle is considered one of Europe's great fortresses. Edward I built it as his headquarters in his efforts to control the Welsh. Originally, the exterior of the castle was whitewashed. Like Chester, the town of Conwy is still totally enclosed in ancient walls, but in some spots, more modern buildings are encroaching. From a castle built in the 13th century to this Elizabethan house, the Welsh town of Conwy is a tribute to ancient architecture. This house is called Plasmar. It's protected by the National Trust and is open to visitors. Down by the harbor sits a house with a claim to fame. It's the smallest house in Britain. A woman dressed in a traditional Welsh costume invites visitors for a brief tour. Conway is a fishing port. Fishermen still tend their nets on the quayside. But today there are almost as many pleasure and tour boats as there are commercial boats. Tourists can choose a slow cruise upriver or a day of fishing. Beyond Conwy, the scenery becomes increasingly spectacular. The wild lands of Sitchnet Pass are just a few miles away. And further along the coast, the beaches of Conwy Bay are vast and empty. Resuming our railway adventure, we head south down the Conwy Valley to Tallycaffin. This small country station is the jumping off point for Bodnet Gardens, said to be the most spectacular in Wales. The gardens were developed in the early part of the century by Lord Aber Conway. They started off as a series of Italian-style terraces, but soon grew into a series of landscapes covering over 80 acres. The Laburnum Arch is a centerpiece of the garden. In late May, it's covered with golden blooms. The Pin Mill Building comes from Worcester and was rebuilt here in 1938. At the base of the garden is the dell, formed by the valley of the river Hyrethlin. These gardens are cared for and preserved by Britain's National Trust. Traveling through the Conwy Valley, it's on to Clandrust. Here the Conwy River forms a natural barrier. Typical Welsh communities sit at the base of old-fashioned bridges. Shops and cafes cater to visitors passing through the valley. But a circular stone monument is a legacy left from the first inhabitants of the area.
And on the other bank of the river, an ancient church breaks the skyline. Following the Conwy River, the train is headed for Betasi Coed, our next stop. The largest town in the Conwy Valley is Betasi Coed. Adjacent to the British Rail Station is the Conwy Valley Railway Museum. The museum's main attraction is its steam-powered miniature railway. The line features a real steam locomotive, one-fifth the size of a regular train. The museum also has a shop and dining car where visitors relax and watch the trains go by. The visitor center at Betasi Coed is a good place to begin a tour of the area. Mountains and forests surround the town and the rapids of Conwy Falls are just off the main street. This is an area that caters to hikers, but there are also cafes, restaurants, shops, and a craft center in town. For the more adventurous, there are guided tours into the mountains. A network of hiking trails spread all over the valley. Betasi Coed is in the Snowdonia National Park. It's dominated by Mount Snowdon. At 3,600 feet, it's the highest mountain in England and Wales. Visitors come to enjoy the dramatic scenery or to participate in outdoor sports and activities. Climbing to the top of Snowdon isn't all that difficult especially if you take the Snowden Mountain Railway. The Cog or Rack Railway opened in 1896 and is the only one of its kind in Britain. Thousands of people climb to the summit every year. This 838 square mile expanse of mountains, valleys, lakes, and foaming waterfalls is a hiker's paradise. And from the top, the views span in all directions. Our railway adventure ends here, at the top of Mount Snowden. The trip from Chester to Snowdon has taken us from sea level to Wales' highest summit, and yet we've only sampled the spectacular railway adventures of Wales. We hope you've enjoyed Shore to Summit. I'm Bernie Coppell. Join me on the next Railway Adventures Across Europe. On this railway adventure, a castle of a Welsh king and a journey into the earth as we travel Wales by the Blyney Festiniog Railway and British Rail. Hi, I'm Bernie Coppell. Just up the tracks, slate mines and the home of a man who changed the world. Join me from Porth Madog to Festiniog on Railway Adventures Across Europe. We're about to travel into the heart of Wales. Although it's a small country, its people have had a great impact on the world. Throughout history, they've battled to maintain their spirit of independence. It should be no surprise that a Welshman founded the League of Nations for the sake of freedom and peace worldwide.
Our adventure begins on the coast in Porth Madog. From there, by two railways, we'll travel to Blynai Festiniog and the Slate Mines. During our travels, we'll see castles of both Llewellyn the Great and Edward I, and an Italian-inspired Welsh village. We'll also tour Slate Mines by battery-powered train and visit the boyhood home of a man who changed the world. All this and the scenic splendor of Wales by British Rail and the Festiniog Railway. All aboard for Heart of Freedom. Our railway adventure begins in the tiny country of Wales. It's an ancient land of proud and fiercely independent people and beautiful rugged landscapes. The native language is not English, as we will see from the names of villages on our Welsh adventure. The Welsh language and heritage are actually Celtic, and the best way to learn the history, language, and landscape of Wales is to travel the historic Blaenau Festiniog Railway from Harlech to Blaenau Festiniog. The history of the Festiniog Railway begins in the early 19th century. Then the small country of Wales was no more than a beautiful and remote mountain area whose people managed to live by farming. In 1789, the same year the French Revolution began, William Alexander Maddox arrived in Wales. He accomplished almost as great a revolution in this rugged land. Maddox's adventures, mostly reclaiming land from the sea, almost left him bankrupt. One project involved building a great bank of land, known as the Cobb, to block off the river Glasland. But Maddox soon began thinking of Slate. He then turned inland to the present-day city of Blaenau Festiniog. He built a port for shipping slate produced in Festiniog. And in 1828, Maddox began building the forerunner of today's Festiniog Railway. Reminders of this railway can still be seen today. The loaded slate trains traveled to the port driven by gravity alone. The empty cars were returned by horses. The railroad was built by hand. The workers used simple hand tools, horses, and black powder to carve the route out of the hardy Welsh mountains. In spite of the lack of tools, the railway opened officially on April 20th, 1836. As the railway began to make money and business increased, steam instead of gravity was used to drive the engines. The company even decided to take passengers. However, the gauge on this railway was too narrow for steam locomotives in the 1840s. So it wasn't until October of 1863 that the Festiniog Steam Railway was open for business. The declining demand for slate forced the railway to close on August 1st, 1946, after more than 100 years of service. However, a new railway era began in the 1950s. In Britain, people who wanted to preserve the picturesque railways began a major restoration movement. It took 31 years of hard work and dedication to rebuild the Festiniog railroads. On May 23, 1982, the first restored passenger train entered the Blaney Festiniog station. Our railway adventure on the Festiniog Railway in Wales will begin along the coast at Harlech, where the rugged Welsh mountains run down to the sea at Cardigan Bay. Harlech has been immortalized in songs and stories. Here, the courageous men of Harlech resisted the invading English soldiers who tried to subdue the Welsh in 1468. The city's impressive castle was built by Edward I in the 1200s on the site of a Celtic fortress. Edward hoped to use this and other castles in Wales to overcome the fierce Welsh resistance to an English takeover. Later in its life, 
Hardock Castle would be the last castle in Great Britain to be subdued by Oliver Cromwell's men in the English Protestant rebellion against Catholic Charles I in the 1600s. Across the Tremadog Bay from Harlech stand the ruins of another magnificent castle. On our next stop, Krikia. This castle was established around 1230 in the time of Llewellyn the Great, the last Welsh king. Sacked and burned in 1404, the castle was never restored. Krikiath is a typical Welsh seaside resort. It offers fine hotels, as well as rail and road links that make it the best place from which to tour the Fleen Peninsula. Two miles northeast of Krikiath is the small village of Flanestum Dwy, here is where Britain's World War I Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, spent much of his early life. Lloyd George lived in this tiny house with his mother and uncle. In 1916, he was elected the 36th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Today, he is remembered for establishing the League of Nations at the end of World War I in 1919. At the end of his distinguished career, Lloyd George returned to this charming village and spent many hours sitting in this tranquil spot which now marks the site of his grave, overlooking the beautiful river Dwyvor. East of Krakiev is the major town of the area, Porthmadog. Here, the rail journey to the small slate mining city of Blynafestiniog begins. The beautiful city of Porthmadog was a shipping town. The proud sailing vessels of the 1800s that carried slate across the seas had been replaced by pleasure yachts of all sizes. Across the harbor, the Festiniog Railway has its station at Harbor Station. Every year in the spring, the Festiniog Railway holds a festival weekend. At that time, all the steam engines are brought out on parade. This is Rishra, being prepared for the festival. This engine is probably the smallest industrial engine ever exported from Britain. It was sold to India, but returned to Wales and restored in 1971. On another siding is Shalona, a rare vertical boiler engine. This weekend, Shalona is giving rides to visitors. Inside the buildings are many displays and models, including this incredible O-gauge model steam railway. During this weekend, photo sessions are set up especially for the visitors, and the engine workshops are open to the public. The engineers demonstrate new, modern equipment, as well as old. Back outside of the Festiniog Railway's harbour station in Wales, the steam locomotive Mountaineer prepares the train for the festival. Mountaineer will take us to the town of Festiniog, 
This engine was built by an American engine company in Patterson, New Jersey. Originally built for the War Department, Mountaineer was used in France during World War I. It was donated to Festiniog in 1967. After traveling two miles, Mountaineer slides into Meanforth Station. Just a half a mile from the station stands the famous Italian-inspired village of Port Marion. Set in 70 acres of subtropical woodland, in a narrow valley, Port Marion offers ever-changing scenes of architectural and natural beauty. The incredible village was built by Sir Clough Williams Ellis between 1925 and 1972. He intended to develop this beautiful site without spoiling it. No doubt about it, he succeeded. There is a first-class hotel on the grounds, and many of the cottages can be rented for vacations and weekends. Back at Meanforth Station, the festivities are in full swing. An antique player piano provides background music while railway staff parade in period costumes. One of the most popular attractions this weekend is the chance to be the engineer of a steam locomotive. Britomart was built in Leeds, England in 1899. Unlike the oil-burning Festiniog engines, Britomart still burns coal. All ages can enjoy a ride on this railway. Here is a scale model of a Darjeeling Himalayan railway engine. On the sidings, the gravity slate train is preparing to run. In the past, the fully loaded slate wagons ran the full 13 and a half miles down to the harbor at Port Maddox by gravity alone, controlled only by brakemen. Once unloaded, the empty wagons were hauled back to Blindy Festiniog by horses. The slate train is hauled up the line to just below the next station at Penthain and released. After a gentle push, it runs by gravity back to the Meanforth yard. The only control the brakemen have is a simple handbrake system. With careful synchronization and skill, they can still manage to bring the heavy slate wagons to a gentle halt. Now it's back on board the train for the climb to the next station, Penflin. The train needs a double engine because of the steep climb through the rugged Welsh mountains. After a short stop at Penflin, the train heads for Tenabuk. Once outside of Penflin, the line runs mostly through the beautiful forest. Branches from the trees threaten to scrape the sides of the trains at times. Just out of Tenabuk, seven and a half miles from Port Mado, the train encounters a steep gradient. Here is where the two engines are really needed. Climbing high above the beautiful valley, the train approaches one of the technical marvels of the railway. At the next station, 
the Alts. The engineers reconstructing the line in the 1950s faced a major problem. They could not use the original steam route to Festiniog because the central electricity generating board had built a reservoir for electrical generation on the original track. So the engineers had to construct the railway higher to bypass the reservoir. The original Festiniog railway line continued to the old Moylewind tunnel. To gain height, the new line had to be built in an open spiral, unique in Britain, before continuing through a new tunnel higher up the mountainside. Here's the best view of the spiral. The first part is hidden in the trees, but once in the open, the line crosses over itself before swinging around behind this small hill. Emerging once more, the train completes its 360-degree turn. The root of the old track bed in many of the original timbers can still be seen beneath the new embankment. Now through Moylewind Tunnel, the train sweeps around the reservoir at Tanigrishia and arrives at the station of the same name. This reservoir has tamed and harnessed the power of the humble mountain stream through pumped hydroelectric generating stations. The designers of this station took great care to make the least environmental impact. Local stone was used and only one third of the building is visible above ground. At peak periods, this station is capable of sending 360 megawatts of electricity from four enormous turbines into the national electric grid in under 60 seconds. At full output, the water leaves the upper reservoir 233 yards higher up the mountain at a rate of 132 million gallons per hour. The station was dedicated in 1963 by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Visitors are welcome and guided tours are available seven days a week. But now, back to the rail. The final section of the railway runs between houses on the outskirts of Blyneye Festinio. Man-made mountains of slate waste, a reminder of the past, surround the town. Visitors can take buses from the center of town to the slate mines at Fleckwave, on the outskirts of Blyneye Festinio. There an exhibit, a guided tour, and practical examples demonstrate in graphic detail how slate was mined. The quarry is still active today. Visitors must wear hard hats. The small battery-powered train is well protected, though. Don't worry about the fact that the tunnel is just inches above you. Once inside, a guide explains how miners drilled the rock with only primitive tools in almost total darkness. Slate exhibits inside the mine illustrate the harsh conditions miners used to work under. Emerging once again into the daylight, be sure to see the slate being cut by an expert. The slate must be initially split and then cut down to the required size. Our railway adventure on the Festiniog Railway ends with a return trip to Porthmado. We'll have plenty of time to reflect on the enduring spirit and strength of the people in this tiny country of rugged landscapes. Wales is known for its rugged beauty, the independent spirit of its people, ancient Celtic heritage, and its slate mines. We hope you've enjoyed Heart of Freedom. I'm Bernie Coppell. Join me on the next Railway Adventures Across Europe. On the next World's Greatest Train Ride Video Adventure.